Welcome to Need to Know Economics, where we cover anything economics, technology, politics, and history. Today we're going to talk about the history of Japan and how it became an economic powerhouse and where it is today. But we're going to start by rewinding it back to 1989 when Bobby Brown was the world's biggest pop star and conveniently enough the Cincinnati Bengals were in their last Super Bowl but against the other California team, the 49ers. Today we're so used to America leading the world's business and China really being that second place. But back in 1989, four of the top market cap companies were from Japan and 13 of the top 20 were also from Japan, outpacing the United States by wide margins. On top of that, many would think the world's second largest economy was the Soviet Union, but it wasn't. It was Japan, and this small little island's real estate was worth more than the entire United States. The same fears you hear today about China becoming the world's top superpower and outpacing the United States were being thrown at Japan back in 1989. If you're over your 50s, this may sound familiar, but if you're like me in your 20s and 30s, Japan is just that country that has a ton of elderly people, some cool technology, some cool car companies, and great anime. And I will say as a proud 90s baby, they definitely had some awesome cartoons back in the day. But all in all, this distortion of what we see Japan as today and what we saw them back in 1989 was really caused by this great financial crisis we call today the 1990s Japanese asset bubble. And that's what we're going to take a deep dive in today. Get ready. Throwing it back, Japan was one of the Axis powers during World War II, which many of you may know them for the horrific events of Pearl Harbor and the nuclear attacks on two of their cities during the war. But what you may not know is what happened to Japan following the war. I've noticed that many conservative pundits like to claim that the only reason the United States boomed after World War II was because the rest of the world was destroyed when asked about questions about high taxes correlating with the prosperity. But this claim is absolutely false. But honestly, who's shocked? But in reality, following World War II, most of the world, and especially Japan, had one of the fastest growing economies in world history. We often like to call this the Japanese miracle. This started following World War II and the defeat of Japan, where they moved more towards a US FDR style economy, transitioning their war production towards consumer production. Led by their Ministry of Finance, Japan placed aggressive lending objectives called window guidance on banks to increase entrepreneurship, while all at the same time providing social economic democracy to its citizens through raising wages, union protections, wealth redistribution, and crackdowns on excess competition. This resulted in Japan seeing over 8% year-over-year GDP growth in the years following the war into the 1980s, almost much like China has seen over the past 20 years. But as time went on and Western nations began facing battles over inflation, many of these nations pursued neoliberal policies of shareholder capitalism, where propaganda of myth-free markets, deregulation, tax cuts for the rich, outsourcing, easy credit conditions, and huge asset bubbles were seen as the solutions towards inflationary pressures. And they were right to some extent in the moment that supply production did need to quickly increase due to the large increase of baby boomer consumers and workers. But sacrificing your industrial sectors, the middle class, and growth was not the answer. And Japan soon followed suit with the Western nations in pursuit of this shareholder capitalism. And the 1980s was Japan's first step working with the Western nations towards this neoliberal free market shareholder capitalism. And it started with the agreement of the Plaza Accord in 1985. At the time, the dollar was at a record high. The United States needed to weaken its currency against the Japanese yen by pushing for more asset inflation by easing capital conditions in Japan. Japan's second step was to begin to deregulate and destroy its window guidance lending policy to allow banks to run free with credit expansion. This pivot allowed banks to move its lending for entrepreneurship and businesses more towards speculation into assets such as real estate and stocks to grow this asset bubble. This made a ton of people on Wall Street really rich, and without government spending increases during this entire period, the private sector debt increased by tenfold in the 1980s due to this banking deregulation. The third step in Japan's free market migration was diminishing its unions and outsourcing its industry, which it reformed and successfully moved supply chains offshore to China and other nations losing its once promising jobs. During this five-year period of a migration more towards air quotes free market capitalism, the Japanese stock market went from roughly 11,000 to over 30,000 in just five years. That's a higher return than Dow has had since the bottom of the 2008 housing crisis in just 14 years to today. 
And once these steps were completed, Japan had bubbled their economic assets to unseen levels, and it only took time for capital to leave this once driving island for its next victim. And that time it came in 1990. Japan had seen 3% inflation in 1989, and many of the free market inflation fear mongers pushed that Japan needed to raise its interest rates in 1989. As many would expect, this immediately caused a recession in 1989, where it led the Japanese stock market to quickly drop 25% in the first three months of 1990, and it ended the year down 40% from those 1989 highs. As we discussed in our 2022 economics risk video, many of these inflationary fear mongers do not understand the difference between true inflation and consumer price increases from supply disruptions, fighting against deflation. And this is exactly what caused the Japanese deflationary shock to ignite this asset bubble popping. And just like many of these inflationary fear mongers, Japan did not know that their economy was not in fear of inflation, but actually quite the opposite, due to the large amounts of private debt and the hollowing of their society, demographics, jobs, industry, and the large asset bubble they created, but were fighting the biggest battle of deflation we have ever seen in world history. And this deflation quickly evolved into the deflationary spiral we spoke of. The asset bubble produced three years of negative GDP growth following the 1989 asset bubble highs. On top of that, unemployment in Japan was still pretty low at 3%. But as the deflationary spiral continued, the unregulated capitalism in Japan began eating at its economy until one point in the late 1990s it began hitting the labor markets. This is where unemployment began quickly rising, and shareholders continued to lose asset values in their stocks with the stock market being down nearly 60% from the 1989 highs, and they began quickly moving jobs overseas for better profit margins. This not only increased unemployment, but caused GDP to continue to decline. But this also caused a massive sociological effect called Kuroshi in Japan, where stress-related suicides became the leading cause of death during the 1990s. And honestly, if it couldn't get any worse, family formation slowed in Japan, causing even lower birth rates, which lowered future expectations for Japan's economy as this free market capitalism began to run its course. And eventually, in the early 2000s, Japan had finally received what it wanted. Down nearly 82% from the Japanese stock market 1989 highs, and over $1 trillion lost in total GDP, the extremely high unemployment, the extremely low birth rates, the larger retirement problems, the massive inequality and lower wages. This kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? And I hope this rings a bell for many of you listening, but the free market capitalists had finally got their reform. The pension system was depleted, the postal system was privatized, taxes were lowered for the wealthy, and the same politicians who were in the United States who worked in the Ministry of Finance to privatize and deregulate the banking system were finally now working at the Bank of Japan conveniently. And all in all, Japan hasn't gotten much better since. Because of many of these free market structural reforms they had in Japan that impact it's had on its people, there's basically no family formation in the country anymore, let alone confidence to reproduce and have children. And on top of that, the high suicide rates and Kuroshi that's affecting its population. Japan, who had had a FDR-style economy where the economy actually worked for the people, where they felt confident to form families, have children, consume and produce goods, and really just enjoy their lives as a nation and grow together, had now migrated into this free market shareholder capitalist economy, where basically the population now works for the economy and for the shareholders' profits and nothing else, where they don't feel confident having children and forming families, and everything is about profit. And now Japan's population has been declining since 2008 for the first time in its history, and not due to a war or some type of plague or natural disaster, but just due to elderly deaths outpacing births because the economy is so bad for the people itself. And they're projected to lose half of their population, or roughly 60 million people due to this phenomenon, by 2100. And as Japan's population declines, now it sees less capital investment from these free market capitalists as they've used it up and had the people basically squeezed for their own shareholder profits and now no longer see interest in a declining country. 
But the sad part about it is, they created this declining country. And after years of watching this disaster, you would think the United States and our population would learn our lesson and not vote for free market capitalist and deregulation policies, much like what led up to the 2008 housing crisis. But no, we have not changed our direction and still believe in the ideologue policies of the 1980s. But on the bright side, I guess we have taken some decent or questionable practices from Japan, such as quantitative easing, which we use during crises ourselves. Quantitative easing has really done a good job at keeping the status quo of massive inequality and keeping up asset prices, but at the same time, it's caused that massive inequality and reduction in prosperity across our own country, which we've seen in lower birth rates and family formation. And quantitative easing has allowed us to keep the status quo and has enabled many politicians to continue to lie to the public about different metrics such as low unemployment despite lower birth rates and lower labor force participation rates or more inequality so they could keep their corporate interests and keep the status quo. But all in all, we can learn a lot from this Japanese 1990s asset bubble even if our leaders don't learn so we could pressure them to make better decisions. And to wrap this video up, this video wouldn't have been created without the help and the work done by Professor Richard Warner. As Need to Know Economics does not work directly with Richard Warner, he has done tons of great work on this history of Japan and especially the Japanese asset bubble of the 1990s. He had actually coined the term quantitative easing when it started in the 1990s. And he's written a book called The Princes of the End, which I would highly recommend many of you to read. He's been in and out of corporations, government, and has really taken a deep dive from a third party perspective and internally within Japan. So I would highly recommend researching him, watching some of his YouTube videos, reading his book, and just getting involved on some of his content. And we thought it would be useful to drop the link below into the Princes of Yen overview done by Richard Warner and really how he took this deep dive into Japan's asset bubble in the 1990s. But thank you guys for joining in and I hope you continue to watch and make sure you smash that like button if you like this type of content and subscribe. We also created a Patreon to support us in making this type of content. Just search needtoknoweconomics.com backslash Patreon to join. Money can be frustrating, and that's why we partner with companies that make money easy like Acorns. As a child, I used to love going to the coinage machines at the grocery stores just to see how much money I saved from my paper route and all my pocket change. But as I got older and stopped using cash, I stopped going. And on top of that, all the change I saved up was depreciating in value every day. And that's where Acorns makes this process easy and efficient in today's digital world. Acorn rounds up every transaction on your debit card to the nearest dollar and invests it into indexes that appreciate over time into savings, retirements, or even your child's investment account. They'll even ship you a debit card to earn cash back from hundreds of different online stores. Just go to needtoknoweconomics.com backslash acorns to create an account and get a $5 bonus investment.